Okay, by our uh, watch, we're a couple minutes after uh, the scheduled time. My name is um, Greg Robinson, and I work for Radiation Oncology Resources. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to dial in and uh, view our presentation. Uh, just a couple logistical things up front. If you have questions, uh, you can use the chat feature. If your line isn't muted, you might want to go ahead and, and just do that. I think with this... Um, particular forum, it automatically mutes everyone's line, but just in case, uh, go ahead and do that. And uh, we will try our best to get to all of the questions that get asked in the chat session at the very end. We have included a lot of the most commonly asked ones that we receive and have received uh, since first giving a presentation similar to this. Uh, and we'll, we'll go through those and hopefully that answers a lot of the questions that you might be thinking about. Uh, Otherwise, if we don't get to all of them, we will address those in other forums. Um, the CE credits will be automatically taken care of, so don't worry about that. Um, our office manager will be in touch and send you the appropriate uh, paperwork to take care of all of that. And uh, without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we had uh, a presentation that ran this morning and had a lot of great um, questions and feedback from that that we've also incorporated into this afternoon's. Uh, this, if you're not familiar with our company or the plan challenge, we'll just dive into that uh, briefly and describe not only what we do on a daily basis, but this project in particular. And truly this is just an encore presentation of the, uh, of the results um, presentation that we gave at the National AAMD meeting in St. Louis. We've included uh, some pieces of information to, a little bit beyond that. And so if you've seen the presentation, uh, you'll see a couple uh, new little items that we'll uh, be introducing in this talk as well as, uh, you know, just hitting some of the commonly asked questions that we've seen uh, or heard since then. So quickly, um, we work closely with a gentleman by the name of Ben Nelms, who not only is a PhD physicist, but also uh, and has worked with us in some of the publications uh, in the past. He's also a software developer who has developed software programs like Structure, which is a contour analysis tool for standard imaging, and other products such as um, 3DVH for a company called Sun Nuclear. We uh, started the presentation um, every time we've given this uh, with a little riddle, and, and that is, what do the following things have in common? A window, an x-ray, a fishbowl, and the future of dosimetry. We're going to come back to that at the very end, so just keep that in the back of your mind uh, as we go through this, this presentation. A quick overview. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm a little webinared out, and I know there's been some great presentations this month. Uh, we also give a lot of... Um, uh, presentations in regards to this particular project, so I don't want to waste your time if you're familiar with the history of this company and the project itself. We've kind of removed some of that information so to avoid redundancy. Uh, if you're interested in more information in those regards, you can always visit our website. We'll be posting some additional information in, in that regard. Uh, we will touch on some of the newer things that we did for this year's plan challenge in relation to previous years. And this whole idea of uh, the PQM, this concept of a plan quality metric, why we decided to use it, uh, what was different about this year and what led up to us using it and incorporating it, and how we feel th that a, a metric such as this may be important in the future of plan evaluation. Beyond that, we'll uh, announce uh, some of the winners for this project, and, and we really uh, don't like to place too much emphasis or focus on the fact that uh, that that we have a winner. It, it does help with the participation. Uh, I'm not going to lie, if we didn't have some sort of winner announced, we'd probably be talking amongst ourselves and not have the opportunity to work with several hundred clinicians. I think it's all embedded in our DNA as dosimetrists and uh, treatment planners to be a little bit competitive and to try to do the best we can absolutely do. So having this quote-unquote competition uh, definitely lends to more people participating, and I think a direct result of that is having more valuable information out of that. So 
really what we want to focus on is an evaluation of the PQM specifically and some of the trends that we saw uh, out of this year's plan challenge and then also where we hope that this can go in the future. I always take for granted that with some of the social media outlets and just networking at different shows that everyone's pretty familiar with what we do and what we're about. Uh, we have had people come up to us afterwards and said, what, what is it exactly that you guys do? We, we have roots. Um, we're all uh, CMDs or a CMD-based company uh, focused. Um, our roots are really embedded in, in remote treatment planning. Uh, both off-site and on-site, we do uh, cover some local centers. Our headquarters are located just around the cancer center within the hospital in uh, South Bend, Indiana. And we have uh, several dosimetrists that work and are scattered um, throughout the country. We, through the years of, of planning and our own clinical experience, we've kind of come together and through some of the projects that we've been involved with, like the Plan Challenge, have kind of dove into, dove into this pool of uh, education and mentoring uh, and l working with different researchers to publish some of the data that we uh, get back. As I said, some of our newer philosophies with the plan challenge um, and some of the projects that we're involved in, they, they're, they're, they've evolved from our traditional remote planning business model. And in regards to the plan challenge itself, uh, it's really inspired by a former colleague of ours, Vicky Lacerba, a dosimetrist and physicist who um, uh, passed away a few years ago. We've, if you're interested in more about her story, you can uh, visit her website, and we'll post some information on our website about that. Um, but about six years ago, she had an idea to start what she called a plan challenge to uh, just talk about different planning ideas. And so we continue this project in her legacy and in her honor, uh, really just to have some sort of non-biased open forum uh, to, to share different ideas. If you've, if you've been a part of any of our presentations in the past, this is kind of old hat, old news, so I won't spend too much time on it. Uh, we will post some information about the history of the challenge so that we don't spend too much time on it uh, in a different forum. But really, the way it's set up is very simple. Uh, post a single set of CT images online, open that up to treatment planners all over the world where they can access the information and they are given a prescription and the target volumes. Uh, we did add uh, the critical structure volumes, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, and why we did that this year. And then downloading those, doing the uh, best possible plan that they can do, and sending back those DICOM files uh, to us for uh, basically comparative uh, analysis. So in 2009, uh, we started this project. This, um, you know, and really I should emphasize that this has been a volunteer project. Um, Internally, we do not uh, have any bias towards one vendor or another. Uh, I think um, for whatever reason, I think we've given the impression that that's, that's the case. We, we started with Eclipse and Pinnacle just because that seemed to be the biggest user base at the time, what we were most familiar with. And in 2009, we had a 3PTV head and neck with 100 people that registered and 32 plans that qualified. Following that, in 2010, uh, the numbers uh, grew, which was exciting to see, and also the scope internationally uh, as well. We opened it up to uh, CMS at the time, now ELECTA, treatment planning system. Uh, it was a GYN-IMRT case, and uh, it was uh, a little bit more sophisticated, a 2PTV case. And, uh, the, and, and that particular challenge, as well as the head and neck, the contours were, were not provided for the critical structures. And so what was interesting was some of the contouring variability uh, information that we had. I, we did not incorporate those slides on this particular one because we've, we've gone over it so many times in the past. But, uh, for instance, it was interesting to note, you know, what one dosimetrist versus another uh, across the country may view as the parotid on the same data set. And then taking that one step further and looking at how dosimetrically uh, what the effect was. That information with Ben Nelm's help and Dr. Wheeler um, was published in the Red Journal uh, recently. And really through this project, not only with contouring variability, but also planning variability, it was, it was definitely evident. Uh, one of the things that I think resonated with us a lot 
was that there was a lack of benchmarks uh, is kind of an overused word, but you know having the ability to do any type of self assessment and comparative effectiveness with uh, other clinicians on the same task. And what we knew at the very least is that technology was only going to be part of the solution moving forward, at least clinically, such as you know contouring atlases and things of that nature. There's always going to be that human element. And so how can we provide an open forum to stay committed to diving into this area of benchmarks or best practices, which <clears throat> this these th these items here have really become our lofty goals that we've set for ourselves through this project that, um, you know, to be able to identify those best practices, to benchmark the performance of the best planners in the industry, and then share those findings so that, you know, to see what we can learn. And, and, and trust me, we've learned a tremendous amount more than we've shared through this, and uh, we hope to continue to do so. The, uh, the process of uh, comparing processes and metrics is kind of this formal definition of best practices, and if you've been to ASTRO or any of the meetings recently, uh, it's definitely the buzz, and, and especially in light of the New York Times articles and you know everything centering, centering around quality and safety, uh, that's really uh, goes hand in hand with, with this project in particular. At least we feel that way. And one of the common questions that we ask when we're involved um, in any type of training or just um, you know talking to other people uh, in the industry is what is your definition of quality and consistency? How do you define that in your clinic? And I think these are the most common responses that we hear. These are probably the responses that we would give uh, traditionally, which is uh, the education that we've received, whether we've come from some high reputable academic center or certification level, uh, continuing education credits, things of that nature, definitely help as, as, as important as all of these things are. The follow-up question is, how are these things working for us in this realm of establishing not only baselines but common metrics and then having the ability to take those and have some sort of self-assessment in this area of benchmarks and best practices. So what we've discovered, I think, is that uh, in, in search of all these answers that we're ask, we were asking the wrong question. It's not can you define good versus bad, it's more what is acceptable versus what is possible. And so through the last few years of doing this project, We've demonstrated that variability exists in contouring and planning. So what? Uh, there's a lot of publications out there that allude to this. That's not a uh, a, not a new idea that uh, you know having the ability to plan the same or contour the same. If we pulled 100 different clinicians in a room after doing work separately, that you would see differences. And um, in the past, with the plan challenge specifically, when we were looking at I guess the scoring techniques, if you want to call it that. They, we would like to think that they weren't this objective. Uh, they, they weren't quantitative in any way, probably, because uh, they weren't provided at the beginning, and we'll talk about that in a second. You know, as far as looking at the plans and announcing a quote-unquote winner, uh, there were things looked at just that are important um, in, in any scope of evaluating a plan. Contouring analysis, the conformality, these are just a few examples of common things that are looked at when evaluating plans. and all of those things went into, um, you know, ultimately choosing, I guess, what what that best plan was. But uh, the exact metrics or, I guess, scoring sheet was never provided up front. And uh, so, with this year's project in, in 2011, we opted to do a prostate fossa case, which was a two PTV case, a little bit more uh, challenging. We wanted to do something that was clinically relevant, but it, it was not your standard prostate fossa case in the sense of the word. The um, one difference was we did open it up to all uh, or at least six planning systems, uh, Eclipse, Pinnacle, Electa, Tomo, Ray Search, and Nucleotron. We had uh, even more participation than we had last year, which was very encouraging to see. Uh, the prescription itself, this is a screenshot of uh, the sagittal view of the data set, the pink 
volume there, the magenta volume, was the PTV uh, 68. There was also a PTV 56, all in the same plan. We gave the prescription as well as the uh, brief H&P uh, online, uh, you know, and, and then uh, asked that 95% volume of each PTV receive the prescribed doses. Uh, one of the other um, differences from the years past, and we, we knew that we were going to do this last year because we wanted to remove one more variable from looking at uh, planning variability. We've, we've separated uh, the contouring challenges and the plan challenges on purpose, and we wanted to provide a, just a standardized or, a, I guess, a, a uniform set of critical structures for analysis. So truly, uh, just looking at the ability to move dose around uh, on, and, and cover a target while avoiding um, areas at risk. And so the data set itself, this hopefully the lag time on your end is, uh, is uh, not horrible, but this will kind of track uh, superior and inferior, showing uh, both the PTVs, the bladder, the rectum, the penile bulb, uh, the femoral heads, all of the structures that were provided. From... From a bird's eye view, uh, and knowing that it was a prostate fossa case, I think the assumption was that it was going to be a slam dunk, and it definitely, had, and, and we experienced the same thing when you uh, started the plan and, and tried to achieve some of the metrics that were that were um, published. It was definitely more difficult uh, than we originally thought it would be. But uh, so this whole idea of a PQM, this plan quality metric idea, what we we had come to this kind of fork in the road, this decision that we. We knew we wanted to do something different. We had had some feedback uh, from past participants, and we had thrown the idea around about being a little bit more uh, transparent with the published metrics or the scoring criteria. And we had avoided it in the past because we didn't want to be viewed as, you know, somehow providing this absolute standard of plan evaluation. Uh, but what we found was that we were doing probably more harm than good by not providing those, and that really. Uh, to have more value in the information that we would receive back, it was probably uh, going to serve us well and serve everyone else well to provide some sp more specifics. So we we know that metrics uh, from other studies and from other industries that quantitative analysis is um, an important um, consequence of of metrics. Uh, it helps to establish baselines. And like I said, we kind of dove into this um, whole idea of PQM mainly because of uh, feedback from from everyone that had participated. And that's what's been nice about this project is that we feel like it's as much everyone else's as it is ours. And and that's that's really been uh, encouraging for us and exciting for us. We were already two weeks into the project. We had already posted the data set online, and, and we were hesitant to make the change, even though we knew uh, we were getting some um, a lot of requests to provide some more specifics. And I think the um, ultimately when we decided to go ahead and make that change, uh, since we had started the project, we had been the ones to create the initial rules, and we had, I guess, the leeway and the power to change them, uh, we did have that choice. We were two weeks in, and the decision for me, I guess I remember driving down the highway and seeing a slew of billboards along the highway, and I don't know if anyone else is as cynical as I am when you see these, all these health care, it's definitely a, a business, there's no question about it, but when you see these medical uh, billboards along the highway and in and, and an attempt to communicate to the average uh, public or possible future patient um, or, or family member, uh, is to communicate this whole idea of quality or uh, that you're going to come here and receive great care. And this is one that's kind of humorous. This is one that we saw online. But, you know, m most of the ones that you see when you're driving along, you see these uh, promoting the people or the academic institution or the technology. I think the main point of which is to communicate somehow that if you come to our facility, you're going to receive the best quality and consistency and care that you can possibly receive. And even the government has stepped in with the care bill, I think, uh, as a starting point to uh, address inefficiencies and lack of quality in this realm of um, licensure and certification and, and equating that to reimbursement and, and uh, ultimately, I guess, uh, being accountable for what you do. And we're not claiming to say that 
somehow our idea with metrics is a new idea. I mean, you can look at quality metrics in any industry, whether that's manufacturing, automotive, uh, and it all kind of comes full circle back to this whole idea of this Lean Six Sigma and 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 some other ways of evaluating uh, quality in, in the dimming in the dimming way. I think everyone's heard of uh, of that. Uh, when you talk about metrics specifically, like I said before, the one thing that you can pull from providing metrics is having a quantitative instead of an objective or a, a subjective way to evaluate, and, and that's definitely important, especially with plan evaluation, you know, getting away from this whole idea of what is a good plan, it's what my doctor says it is, and, and really trying to kind of lay out some guidelines. And so we stated this on our website, we weren't claiming to uh, introduce anything new. It, there's tons of examples within our own industry about utilizing metrics, whether that's, um, st you know, some of these published papers and uh, the stereotactic world, or there's been a lot of work. Specifically, one example is uh, the group, Dr. Rodriguez's group in London, uh, Ontario, uh, in their work with contouring variability and defining quantitative ways to evaluate that. Uh, benchmarking reports are all over the place. This is one example of a, a unified dosimetry index, an example of a, a metric with stereotactic radio surgery is the, the journals are, are riddled with articles in, 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 in light of that. So we were sold on this idea of metrics and wanted to provide some sort of, uh, I guess, be the virtual, the perfect virtual physician. Uh, <laughs> and, and you know as well as I do, that's sometimes difficult to, to have up front when you're doing a plan. And we had a good idea of some of the sub metrics that we wanted to provide. I guess our starting point was less about what we wanted to provide and more about what we had seen in the past and how maybe we might penalize things that we didn't want to see or that maybe a physician wouldn't want to see with a plan. So this you know whole idea of lack of conformality or uh, streaking outside of the PTV um, lack of coverage when it comes to, let's say, normalization, uh, lack of sparing in spite of uh, excellent coverage, uh, the location of the global max in the wrong PTV, um, and those are just a few examples of that, uh, you know, in reference to the slope of the PTV line, how much, so it's one thing to have minimum target coverage, but what's the slope of that line look like? How how I guess uh, this would relate back to the homogeneity index or how uniform is the dose throughout the PTV. Is there um, streaking or, or high peripheral dose uh, as a trade-off to achieve sparing? So these are just a few examples of some of the things that we are trying to address in within the metric itself. Uh, we posted this statement on our website uh, just to reiterate we, we we're definitely, our, our big goal with this project is to somehow um, find some way uh, to be able to collect data uh, to help with um, sharing of information and best practices in this industry, but it really, we just wanted to mirror the things that are familiar to most people, but we weren't claiming that any, by any stretch of the imagination that this was going to be some sort of absolute or that they were going to be unique in any way. Um, the PQM itself was really just a summation of all the individual submetrics. So we proposed 14 different uh, metrics uh, for this particular case, and then the total score uh, would be what was deemed the PQM score. And when you tallied up each individual category, the total max score possible was 150, although uh, with all of the trade-offs with planning, we purposely set it up that that would not be even clinically achievable, that something would have to give along the way. Uh, this is a really busy slide, but if you look at the at the left side of the uh, screen here, you can see the list of uh, all the different metric components, if you're not familiar with what we had published online, um, and we'll break down each one. These slides are a little dry, so bear with me. We'll get to the exciting stuff as far as the overall results in a second. But um, quickly, just diving into some examples here with the metrics themselves. So if you're looking at this for the first time, essentially you would receive 30 points if you had 95% volume coverage on the PTV 68. So all the, the 13 remaining metrics kind of followed suit. 
uh, we we just uh, uh, put a um, you know whatever uh, goal it was that was uh, trying to be achieved we just made up some point values and and determined some uh, kind of what made sense to us uh, we were inspired from different uh, parameters that are out there such as RTOG protocols and Fox Chase protocols and and things like that but uh, there this other one here relates to the max dose of the PTV so in other words if your plan was uh, 7140 which I think is about 105 overall um, percent above prescription dose then you would receive 10 points and then penalized um, from there or not rewarded as many points beyond that value and so the PTV 68 itself uh, is shown here and like I said we used the RTOG protocol 0534 as kind of a guide and um, and, and some inspiration to developing uh, some of the submetrics and here this shows a list of all of the structures once again that we had used and then and then just a, a overall DVH well these images may look uh, foreign to most people because they're not from a uh, common treatment planning system we utilized a tool called 3DVH which I'll uh, get to in a second but this is just a snapshot of um, the some color wash images a DVH uh, from that software program that we use to develop the scores. This is a, a piece taken from the RTOG protocol uh, referring to you know one of the submetrics that that we tried to um, uh, accomplish and one of the things I wanted to point out was this whole idea of a deviation uh, accept, acceptable uh, or variance acceptable limit so we when you're looking at some of our our metrics, um, we we tried to incorporate that philosophy in in some of the metrics as well. For instance, we didn't want to have a pass fail criteria if you didn't have 95% volume coverage on the prescription dose for that particular PTV. We didn't want to see the plan completely tossed out if you had a 94.7, and still wanted to see some points awarded for that. And so the the slope of the line wasn't as severe down to about 93 percent and then penalize more heavily beyond that and this shows the overlap of the PTV 56 into the PTV 68 so it was not an uh, an easy thing to accomplish to have uh, not only met the tumor coverage minimums but also um, control the uh, homogeneity throughout the two PTVs but I think that was a good image to, to show that in addition to the PTV coverage, we wanted to uh, have a, a metric that addressed the uh, GTV coverage as well. So uh, following a similar idea, uh, if, if, for instance, if you had 98% coverage on the plan, you'd get about 9.5 points uh, for this particular submetric. And this just shows in red here the prostate bed or the um, uh, GTV volume. This metric here was one that um, we had a lot of questions about. Uh, we wanted to have some sort of parameter in place that would evaluate the slope of the DVH line for the lower dose PTV when you're differentially dosing um, to be able to control, I guess, the uniformity of dose throughout while still achieving coverage. Uh, we wanted to address that specific thing. So this is a good example. Uh, to illustrate the point here, which is um, taking the low dose PTV, subtracting it uh, from the high dose PTV, and then looking at the subtracted volume uh, in relation to 105% uh, above prescription. So in this case, it was 5880 uh, in relation to 56 gray. And then putting that on the metric and, and assigning a score. This one was addressing uh, some uh, pieces of, I guess, conformality, the prescription dose outside the PTV-68. So how much in CCs of this particular contour was uh, uh, receiving prescription dose or above uh, to this orange volume here. So anything outside the high-dose PTV uh, would get an awarded um, set of points based on the volume of that structure that had prescription dose or above. And this just shows some common ring structures that uh, might be used to help control that dose bleed off. And it was graphed 
on a DVH just like any other structure and then the dose stats were recorded and um, on in our software program and then assigned a, a point value. This slide here shows the three uh, rectum uh, metrics that were published. One uh, specifically alluding to the um, high dose area at prescription dose and uh, how much volume was encompassed with that and then points related to accordingly and then uh, the V65 and V40 values which I think are pretty familiar if anyone follows the Fox Chase protocol and so we set up some metrics there and and um, this shows that those weren't an easy thing to achieve because of the amount of overlap that was uh, that the rectum had with the PTV itself and uh, we're almost through these metrics, bear with me, I know these are kind of dry, if, if you're like me, I'm somewhat like uh, Pavlov's dog when I hear a bell, when I see this uh, commercial or emblem for five-hour energy, I perk right up. So uh, we're almost through these metrics here. This is one that was related to the bladder, and much like the rectum, you can see that the total points as we go through these are descending, so uh, we put placed a higher point value, obviously, on the targets, and then uh, just trying our best to equate some sort of relative weight factor to each metric as we went down the list. And you can see from this slide here the amount of overlap, I think up to 12% of the bladder with the total PTV. So it wasn't easy to achieve a lot of the, especially the um, mid-range dose sparing. We also had a metric in place to look at where the global max of the plan was, whether it was inside the prostate bed or GTV and that would get a perfect score of five in this case and then down from there if it was in the PTV and, and this was just like I said really not meant to be an absolute because I know there's a lot of uh, clinics in this particular example that may not want the global max in the GTV because of let's say their urethral location um, this was just something that we had opted to use it was I used the analogy before that uh, we it was much like providing the recipe and saying, here, go bake a cake and let's see which one turns out the best. So we weren't saying that this was the only way to do things, but uh, just providing that particular recipe and, and seeing what the results were. And then and looking at the DVH and seeing where the uh, global max location specifically was. So these values were then plugged into our software and assigned uh, particular point values uh, based on that. This one was, I think the... This, this is the second to last metric. Uh, this one was evaluating the 50% isodose line and the ability to bisect the entire rectum. This one was probably the most uh, questioned metric that we had because the way we set it up, it was it was really almost a pass fail. And there, we'll talk about this whole idea of a near miss phenomenon that we saw with several plans and. Um, you know, right or wrong, it was what we opted to do just to test the ability to, to move the dose around, uh, you know, use, utilizing contours such as this to control dose bleed off. Uh, this this shows um, with the CT image actually shut off, but the contours are there. So you see a sagittal view uh, here with the rectum, and just the 34 gray uh, threshold is set here in green. And so it was really just set up to... Uh, evaluate the ability to control the dose bleed off beyond the rectum. So if any one transverse slice was encompassed with 34 gray, then you lost 10 points. Like I said, that was pretty um, a severe penalty because there were a couple that got penalized just for one slice. But um, I guess as the saying goes, it is what it is. The, uh, the, to, to finish this out, we had another one for the bladder at V40. And then... Uh, the last one that we spent some time with uh, and, and probably had the most difficult time coming up with some sort of um, linear penalty or bilinear penalty was the conformity index. There's a lot of different published conformity indexes. We liked this one, or indices I guess you should say. This, this one here we liked the best because it seemed to address not only <clears throat> the conformality of the isodose line but also the location and the shape of it relative to the shape of the PTV. And this was pulled straight from a, 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 a very familiar publication, this formula. Um, so we used the formula based on the contours and the plan and then plugged those into the metric and then a, um, a relative point value was assigned beyond that.
And so in this whole idea of continuous improvement on our website, we had posted this statement here that it really was our goal to be as objective as we possibly could. And hopefully you'll find the, the results that I'm getting ready to show as exciting and as um, informative as, as we did. This, again, has been kind of a volunteer project and um, really kind of a labor of love for us. And, and, and it gets better every year, I think, because of the feedback and the partici participation from everyone out there. And uh, we've, we've tried our best to um, keep everything anonymous. Uh, and I really have to take this minute to thank the AAMD specifically, and I haven't, I didn't do that at the beginning because without their support, I don't think we would have had the outreach that we did uh, to uh, increase the participation as high as it was. And so they really saw, I think, the uh, potential in a project, uh, you know, and the importance of it, and um, and and got behind it the last couple of years. This is a, a movie here showing a screenshot or a uh, kind of a a breakdown of the 3DVH software itself. Uh, you can see that the different contours are all embedded in the program. We could export the DICOM images out um, and look at anything that you could with any uh, treatment planning system, the isodose lines, the DVH. Uh, this tool is specifically used uh, primarily for QA. You can see we can look at the beam's eye view, the profiles, the segments, the gantry angles, the um, the the, the treatment delivery time, the number of monitor units, anything that would be common to evaluating a plan, uh, this software allowed us to do it. And in light of, I guess, trying to come up with a good scientific design and removing as many variables as we could, we opted to use this, um, this uh, third-party piece of software uh, to help us evaluate the plan. So you can see that uh, here we had some uh, dose stats that were relative to the, um, the, the DVH that were allowed us to easily plug those numbers in and, and generate a PQM score. And the nice thing here, and this is what this is showing, an overlay of two DVHs, we, could, we had the ability to not only compare an eclipse plan to an eclipse plan, we could go uh, cross-platform and, and look at a pinnacle versus a tomo plan or a rapid arc plan versus a smart arc plan and, and do some things that we couldn't do uh, within one particular treatment planning system. And so we felt like um, this was a good thing to do to try to remove as many variables as possible. Um, the only thing we couldn't remove, obviously, was the planner, uh, the treatment planning system itself, and the, and the algorithm associated with it. But at least for the analysis piece, um, because of the way the DVHs are bent uh, differently within each treatment planning system, we were hoping to remove that variable um, by use, using this tool. Okay, so the results, uh, we're, we're going on, I think, about 40 minutes here, so I'm going to speed it up a little bit. The, um, if, if you get pulled away clinically or don't have time to uh, view all the information, we will have this talk uh, for free located on all of our social media outlets, the uh, Facebook page and, and website and all of that, and so you'll be able to view it there. So the overall distribution of scores, if you're looking at this, um, kind of interesting, a whole range of PQM scores that were received back anywhere from, um, these are the, the range of PQM values on the bottom, and um, the distribution of the number of uh, PQM scores in five-point increments was then plotted, and then uh, obviously uh, you can see here that a bell curve uh, had, had formed and, and a definite min, max, and, and mean value to be pulled out of this. I think the overall mean uh, was around uh, 117 uh, for all the treatment planning systems. Uh, we could break down this data. So the nice thing with providing the metrics up front is we were able to look at um, <clears throat> how the PQM score related to different things. And I'll, you'll probably hear me say this a few times, but I just want to reiterate the fact that without diving in and doing true you know, root cause analysis with all of the parameters in place, um, it's difficult to remove all the variables and it's difficult to know why the scores that were generated were the way that they were. Uh, so it's difficult really to take the information and form you know, solid conclusions or um, have any assumptions out of it. But 
this is what we uh, collected and, and this is what we're sharing and, and that is um, here are the relative mean scores broken down per planning system and you can see the overall min, max and, and mean is, is there in red. To participate in the, in the project we had a, uh, I guess a survey online with some various questions, one of which was uh, on a scale of one to five, what's your confidence level in doing IMRT or uh, I guess VMAP planning? Uh, five being very confident, one being um, I, I don't know what I'm doing, I guess is how you would equate it. But I think there were some very humble people uh, that answered that. Uh, one in particular uh, was interesting to note that they had probably the highest, one of the highest PQM scores, but not a very high opinion of their ability. And, um, you know, you can see how this was plotted. So on the bottom, increasing confidence levels one through five based uh, relative to the PQM score in uh, in 20 increments here. And so uh, the overall high score around uh, in the 140 values and then um, you can see the distribution. I mean, just some interesting things to note, um, you know, and, and the, moving forward uh, as we are able to know what caused the particular scores or to, to really evaluate um, each individual's own experience level and things of that nature, uh, we'll probably be, be able to make better conclusions from this data. But, um, you know, just some interesting things to share. Uh, this one in particular was related to, I guess, the quote-unquote busyness of um, <clears throat> one site versus another. So uh, the number of plans that are generated per month um, graphed on the, on the bottom and then uh, the, relative to the uh, PQM score. And uh, you can see a, a pretty uh, statistically, um, I don't know if you can make any significant conclusions from, uh, from this, other than one of the things that I think is interesting to note is that uh, you have high scores uh, that were submitted regardless of uh, being really busy or not, or having a, a vast number of plans that are generated uh, per month. The other one that was interesting to look at was the PQM versus years of experience. So um, looking at uh, this, again, um, one thing to note, I think, would be looking at this group here, it seems as if uh, the more years of experience, the less um, uh, extreme um, range of scores there were. Uh, you know, the other one to look at, I think, which is interesting, is this idea of um, being not very, um, uh, you know, not being in the field a very long time or not doing planning. You, you could be fresh out of school, for instance, and still have the ability to uh, generate a high PQM score. So just, um, as I said, some interesting things to, to document and to, and to, to note. Uh, this one here was PQM score versus number of beams. So the ones obviously over here on the left probably relate more to uh, VMAT delivery where you have, uh, you know, one to two arcs uh, and then over to the right showing uh, maybe a collection of static IMRT plans anywhere from five uh, or six to uh, upwards of 11 beams. And I think one thing that might be interesting to point out is that uh, you can still have the ability to um, achieve a high PQM score, at least with this case, uh, even with fewer number of beams. Another interesting parameter that we documented was the number of monitor units. So even though these things weren't part of the actual metric, um, submetrics, we did document the number of monitor units and, and graph that versus PQM. So the first thing to note would probably be this plot of data points over here to the right would uh, be relative to a dynamic or sliding window cases that were received or tomotherapy and then also um, the ones to the left being more of the step and shoot. And I think we'll come back to this point here. I think it's, um, it's def definitely valid to say that one, I think the highest score that was submitted uh, for the PQM had the lowest number or one of the lowest number of total monitor units. So just this whole theme of um, it's not really necessary to have uh, a high number of monitor units to achieve the same score. Um, Again, this was part of our pre-assessment survey, the just in own individual uh, background. I think there was some traffic in regards to a couple of these slides, and really 
uh, you know, this is good information to, to share. Um, what you can really conclude from just one particular data set, I, I think, is up to the individual that wants to take the data and, and do what they what they want with. I think any time in statistics, <clears throat> if you have an end goal in mind, you can s twist and turn some of the information uh, to to really produce the the end result that you're after. I think uh, a good example of that is here in Indiana. We know for certain based on several statistics that Peyton Manning's the best quarterback out there. But if uh, we have people dialed in from New England, I'm sure they would use those same numbers to say otherwise. But just some interesting information to share, um, you know, in regards to people's backgrounds. So JCERT versus non-JCERT and OJT. And keep in mind we had um, uh, several individuals from the international from outside the United States where uh, – this particular slide would allude to a CMD versus a non-CMD where the results here really could be skewed in favor of the non-CMD because outside of the United States uh, that doesn't have a lot of uh, importance at least at this time for, for many people. But um, we wanted to be as transparent as possible and, and, and share the information that we received. So this is the end value and min and max and you can see that um, the, the mean and based on the standard deviation, I don't know that you can really make any statistic conclusions from, from this, but um, there is the information. I think more importantly is to note a lot of the trends that we saw. One, um, and, and we'll get to this and, and kind of uh, talk about a few of them, uh, a lot of which I think we could talk about for days and, and maybe we'll, we'll try to do our best to uh, post some information through our social media and, and website on, on some of these things. But, you know, just some interesting trends that we saw uh, with the plans that came back, uh, like the VMAP peripheral dose being somewhat uh, better uh, consistently compared to the static IMRT plans. And I think there was just a recent article that was published in the Medical Dosimetry Journal in regards to um, dosimetric comparison with VMAT and IMRT. And we, we saw some similar things with this plan challenge uh, that we had seen in, in years past as well and with our own experience clinically. But this is just a list of different things that um, that we had seen, some trends that we'd noticed. This was an interesting one. Um, we did not specify as one of the variables to control uh, uh, of setting a certain uh, calc grid uh, size. And so one thing that we noticed with some of the large majority of the Pinnacle plans, I guess just by default, that the, the, in the third-party software, they looked a lot more voxelated than they did compared to, let's say, a plan such as this with a smaller calc grid size. And so it was interesting to note that um, a large majority, if not all, of the Pinnacle plans are close to it, were submitted with a 4-millimeter calc grid. And with the way that the um, 3DVH uh, bends the DVH, uh, it, it truly, um, and, and Ben Nelms is going to put something together explaining this in greater detail because we're really running out of time. Um, but it, this allowed us really to have the purest form of DVH bending because it looks at individual points and does a good job of not interpolating um, the data. And you, this is just pointing out some differences, for instance, with the lymph node um, volume percent that's recorded at a particular dose the, uh, and showing an overlay of uh, the same plan calculated with a 4 millimeter calc grid and then recalculated with a 2 millimeter calc grid and showing some of the dosimetric differences that we saw in this um, uh, with with the, the 3DVH tool. And and we noticed glaring, or I guess bigger differences with smaller structures such as this magenta line here with the penile bulb. So just some interesting trends to note. Um, the, the differences were very, very subtle, but uh, interesting, to, interesting to record nonetheless. So, like I said, we, this, we're nearing the end of the, um, the presentation here, and we don't like to place too much emphasis on this whole idea of, of having the overall high score or, or winning, but it, it is, has become important in increasing participation. All the winners did receive a brand new plaque uh, with their name, uh, and, um, and I think... Uh, a gift card um, of, of some value there and I'd like to give some moral high moral statement about winning is not that important but in the uh, 
in line uh, with uh, Charlie Sheen. We'll uh, we'll go ahead and honor those that uh, were not only winners but also runners up. So you can see broken down by category here the different runners up and the associated PQM score, and then also um, getting into uh, each category. So for Eclipse IMRT, John Dietrich had an overall PQM score of 140 uh, for for that uh, category. And when we presented, this is an interesting story, when we presented this information um, on stage in St. Louis, uh, one of the uh, attendees was uh, a gentleman by the name of Anthony Magliari who pointed out that uh, some of the, uh, what he had recorded, his PQM score as being was slightly off than what we had, and we noticed that uh, in our final spreadsheet, uh, n not a very high point valued submetric, but one nonetheless was off slightly, and so his score actually uh, bumped up about a point, and um, and really the uh, overall scores became somewhat um, indecipherable for this particular category. So we just went ahead and announced two winners for that. The uh, Eclipse Rapid Arc uh, category went to Noreen Schneck, who had who actually won the Plan Challenge for this category last year and had a PQM score of 137. And then Electa did include uh, CMS and Monaco Treatment Planning Systems. Uh, it was Rob Sessick from Tulsa, Oklahoma in that category with a PQM score of 133. And then for tomotherapy, Richard Vaden, uh, who's a tomotherapy um, apps specialist, actually. And, and this was an interesting conversation because we had some feedback afterwards that um, alluded to the fact that we should eliminate uh, apps specialists from participating, but I don't think, uh, at least, and I'm sure we can agree to disagree on this one, but I think it's it's useful to have whoever wants to participate because they know the system better than anyone, and so it becomes somewhat of a give and take, and 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 um, you know, seeing how what what is truly achievable with the system, you know, they should know the system better than anyone, but at the same time, it gives um, the end user something to um, to achieve. The overall high score was um, on Pinnacle, a static IMRT plan, um, and uh, we've had the opportunity to get to meet Michael uh, Young from Royal Hobart Hospital with the overall PQM score of 142.4. So um, we have had several requests to uh, to share the individual um, that the overall high PQM uh, score and also the breakdown of of each particular submetric, and we're more than happy to do that. And just quickly, we thought it would be a good idea. We'd never uh, tried to accomplish anything like this before, and it was um, I think it was overall a, a good learning experience. We had so many questions come from this project that uh, we wanted to do our best to try to address them and have somewhat of a, a town hall meeting to see, uh, to get collect feedback and also, um, you know, see what was important to others. And there was a, a great talk at that meeting about, um, you know, this idea of critical thinking and in line with the scientific method and that the best scientists or the best um, research, the best scientific um, uh, designs are always the ones at the end when you're searching for all these answers, they, the best ones are always the ones that lead to more questions. And we truly found that to be true with this project when we had reached, I guess, the... Um, metaphorical mountaintop uh, and bringing this uh, project to an end and collecting the data and sharing it, we felt like we were at the bottom of another mountain and, and starting all over again because we had so much great information. Um, we really feel like uh, there's a lot more to come out of this. So just a few examples of some of the questions most commonly that we receive, uh, the VMAP plans compared to static IMRT, better or worse, what's the comparison of delivery time, uh, monitor units. There's no question that the delivery time for VMAP plans and uh, throughput is uh, much, much better, um, at least for Rapid Arc and Smart Arc. But when it came to the quality of the plan, I guess, or the PQM score overall, I think the overall high score was actually a static IMRT plan. And so not much differences there. We, we did um, notice and this is an overlay DVH showing a comparison of uh, the thick line being a static IMRT plan versus a, um, a dashed line here with the rapid arc plan and, and the comparison overlay. We did notice that in the 
low doses, it seemed as if it was easier to control uh, the dose in that area with with uh, rapid arc, but not always or smart arc, but not always a guaranteed. And um, just some uh, interesting dose stats. For instance, um, it, it was it seemed as if it was difficult to control the slope of the um, low dose PTV when it came to doing VMAT uh, planning uh, compared to let's say a static IMRT plan. And, and this is just showing um, a relative comparison that really, especially on the right side of the DVH, it was almost um, splitting hairs when it came to the actual PQM score and looking at the difference between, let's say, the, some of the best uh, static IMRT versus uh, VMAT delivered plans. We had um, questions in regards to uh, what dose constraints or where did we, uh, what did we use to create the metric? And I think we've already answered that. The RTOG Fox Chase was definitely some inspiration to creating some of the submetrics, specifically the RTOG 0534. Uh, one question that we had was uh, noticing some streaking of dose. Was there a metric for the challenge to evaluate peripheral dose? Um, we didn't specifically for this one, but I know in the future that's something we want to address. and. Uh, in line with peripheral dose, also this concept of um, dose bleed off uh, above the rectum, for example, in this case, where you know the conformality may have been good, you may have the the plan may have been able to control the dose bleed off of the 34 gray line, but once that contour came to an end, seeing a spillage of dose just above it. So maybe in the future, doing a better job of um, designing a metric to address that. Uh, you know, maybe designing some metrics that actually address peripheral dose. Uh, another question was, what was the most common number of beams used for the challenge? Um, I think for VMAT delivered plans, it was definitely two arcs was the most common, excluding tomotherapy, of course. And uh, for the static IMRT plans, I would say nine beams was 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 without a doubt the most common beam arrangement. This was an interesting question. Was there any correlation between PQM score and version of planning system? And as everyone's probably very familiar with, when you get a new software upgrade and the algorithm changes slightly or gets a little bit more accurate and um, using the same techniques, uh, it was interesting because we would, at least internally, we were running plans uh, with this. Because we do remote planning for so many centers and we have the opportunity to plan on different versions of the same planning system to run the same case with the same technique and do a comparative analysis, um, really uh, splitting hairs sometimes, but um, did notice slight differences with PQM based on uh, versions of software. So this was, uh, this was a good one. What really is the difference between low, uh, mean, high score clinically? That's hard to say. Uh, I think the only thing that we can say for sure is that we feel like we're starting with this project to ask the right questions, and I think that's where I once heard someone say that wisdom is is not in finding all the answers, but asking the right questions. And once you've obtained all of, I guess, those what's perceived as being the absolute answer, that's when creativity kind of goes out the window. So I think we'll always be in search of some of these answers, but. Um, we did notice some differences in these categories here with uh, with low, me low, medium, and high, I guess, PQM scores. This would be a graphical representation of what I'm talking about. So the solid line here would represent a PQM score of 140 uh, versus a dotted line um, plan that was submitted with um, a PQM score of 100. And so... I think it's a good way to look at the, the difference here, not only with critical structure sparing, what a 140 plan looked like versus a 100, but also the slope of the, uh, the uh, targets. And this is, this is a perfect example of what we're talking about when um, we try to avoid getting hung up on splitting hairs with the overall high scores. Um, for instance, um, really getting hung up on, well, I, I had a 135, and I thought I had a 136, and 
you know, um, beating ourselves up because we were three shy of the overall high. Because when you graphed, let's say, a 140 versus a 132, um, the differences weren't drastic at all, especially in 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 the the DVH and the the target coverage area, and really clinically probably insignificant and um, splitting hair. So I think the the main focus is more about the entire spread and how uh, with the bell curve and how we can better communicate or um, uh, you know evaluate what's causing the, the the wide range of scores. This one is I know there's people dialed in that aren't Eclipse users. So um, at the show uh, in St. Louis, we had some requests for some of the NCO parameters that we use for IMRT and, and rapid arc planning. Uh, we did pass out uh, <clears throat> kind of a cheat sheet that we use. Um, and we will um, give that out to anyone that requests it. If you go to our website and send an email to us at plan at RORresources.com, we can send you that. And maybe we'll do some follow-up uh, breakdown stuff on our um, Facebook page, uh, breaking down that particular document. There was a mention of gradient margins with differentially dosed PTVs. Can you elaborate? This one um, is a common technique that uh, we see, and I know a lot of people dialed in uh, utilize. But instead of just optimizing to the pure subtracted low-dose PTV from the high-dose, actually creating you know some gradient areas for the dose to fall off and it was just interesting to note some of the um, I think some of the higher scored plans and some of the uh, techniques that we use we we noticed some commonalities and uh, I think a common theme was this use of gradient margins and allowing um, in the optimizer to kind of uh, I guess dumb the system down as much as possible and and, and eliminate this um, battle back and forth with controlling dose. And uh, so this might be an example here of an overlay DVH uh, showing um, uh, a plan that used uh, gradient margins. And one of the things that I think we notice a lot is that utilizing, uh, with differentially dosed plans, utilizing uh, gradient margins, having a better control of the slope of the um, low dose PTV. Is global max location really that big of a deal? This was a, a, another great question. Um, I guess it depends on the clinic you're in. This, once again, I, I would go back to the metaphor of using the recipe of baking a cake. Um, that this is the one that we opted to use uh, to see, um, you know, how well or I guess uh, how fast we could drive the system. But um, I, that's dependent on each um, individual clinic or clinician. But uh, you know, it was it was a parameter that we put in place, and it was it had a very small overall point value associated with it, um, and so it, just some interesting stuff to to look at. We'll we'll uh, probably wrap things up here. We'll just take a couple more questions. Which is um, this one here was an interesting one. We did have a lot of plans that were submitted utilizing collimation on the on the, for with VMAP planning. That's a common thing to do to cover the targets, but with the static IMRT plans uh, collimating the um, to get the MLC leaves perpendicular to the target. I think to eliminate interleaf leakage. I think we did see and have seen with our own experience um, better <clears throat> comparative um, not only uh, analysis with the PQM score itself, but overall control um, out of the gates when it comes to optimizing with with uh, dose homogeneity and controlling the slope of the line. Is there a correlation of IMRT experience and improved scores with VMAP planning? We never, I think this is something that um, is somewhat subjective. I, it, 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 it may not even matter really. It was a question that was asked and we didn't, we didn't collect any of that information at the beginning. So that's, that's hard to say. Um, in addition, uh, the VMAP conformity index better than IMRT. With the conformity index that we used, uh, actually, I think some of the higher ones were with static IMRT. Um, I think with the low dose regions, there was definite advantages with with VMAT um, plans. But at least with the high dose conformality index, uh, we did not see an advantage um, with VMAT plans specifically. <clears throat> 
The um, PTV 56 minus PTV 68 metric, uh, that was, again, just to, uh, to look at uh, how steep or how fast the dose fell off on this DVH line, so this idea of um, homogeneity index. And we can uh, follow up with a lot of these points on Facebook if you want a further um, analysis or breakdown on the specifics there because I know we're running short on time and probably have gone over for some people. Um, but really just assigning a point value to um, the ability to control uh, where the high dose was falling um, outside of the high dose PTV. So uh, what would we have done differently uh, after looking at some of this information and this has been a <laughs> It's been a great learning experience for us, and if you have uh, three days, I could probably tell you all the things that we would do differently. I don't think when you take a project on like this, knowing all the variables that go into planning, especially with um, geometric factors and deliverability and physics data and, and algorithms and all of that stuff, it would be impossible to set up the perfect um, project to uh, because our main goal was participation. If we tried to eliminate and have all of these restrictions in place, we would lose the most important thing, and that's participation. And, um, you know, we're going to try to look at some of these main points here and address some of these. The, the ones that we can definitely address uh, right away and we plan on addressing right away is this, um, you know, the, having a minimum uh, parameter in place for the size of the calculation grid and then also this whole idea of a near miss, which, you know, some of the plans were heavily penalized that did it, had high scores throughout and then missed this 34 gray uh, or 50% isodose line um, penalty that we had put in just on one axial slice. And one of the plans, I think, was even one voxel, and that was probably unfair to heavily penalize that. But, you know, it was a metric that we put out and... Um, and I think in the future we're going to try to address this near-miss um, phenomenon by not having it as a pass-fail metric, but more um, as an exponential or, uh, you know, a gradual uh, fall-off penalty. So I know I've uh, talked your ears off and I uh, apologize for going over a little bit, but, uh, you know, back to this question that we asked at the beginning, which is what do the following things have in common? Um, a, a window, an x-ray, a fishbowl and the future of dosimetry. And for us, in, in doing this project, it, it kind of, the answer for us was this idea of transparency. And I think it, it's tough to have even the ability to share information with, um, with our colleagues and our profession, our, our peers, uh, because of the way that uh, we all work. And, and, and not a lot of us have the ability to um, work in large groups or numbers of people. So it's, it's difficult to have not only self-assessment, but to take it one step further, if we're going to go into this arena of best practices and um, accountability, then I think we're going to have to be more transparent about uh, some of the things that we're doing and, and sharing that information, hopefully, uh, you know, getting less focused on, you know, winning or what is this uh, splitting of hairs of, of top scores, but how do we take and the left side of the curve and shift it to the right? How do we better communicate some of the submetrics or how do we uh, help uh, people that might be struggling with um, understanding ways to, um, to get better? And, and I think that's the, one of the nice uh, outcomes of doing a project like, like this. And it's why we continue to do it, in addition to all the positive feedback that we get from everyone that um, is not only here but that has participated in the past. And um, I'll, I guess I'll just end with this quote, which is, uh, you know, information without knowing the experience of others really can't lead you to true wisdom. And so, again, with some of the, the graphs and the data, it truly is just information at this point until we can dive in and look and do a, a, a really um, a root cause analysis of each individual category and what caused uh, that score to be the way it was. It's hard to make, um, you know, valid conclusions or assumptions from that. But um, I know that uh, we feel like this project has been useful, and, and hopefully you do, um, and, and we're going to continue to do it. We try to uh, 
continue this and in, in, in inspiration not only of what Vicki started but also um, what we believe in as a group and if uh, we don't get to ask uh, or to answer any of your specific questions. Um, we will try to do a good job of that through some of these outlets. And if, if you haven't um, uh, joined or uh, signed up for our newsletter, I encourage you to do that because we feel like th this project continues to grow and get better because of feedback from, from the community. And uh, I'm just going to take a quick, gl quick glance at maybe some of the pictures <clears throat> Are some of the uh, questions that have come in and try to answer a couple of these and then we'll um, and, and then we'll address these in, in other forums as well I think there was a request in the future to provide more specifics on um, objectives and um, specifics when it came to the winning plans and uh, we'll definitely uh, do our best to provide some of those. I'm just thumbing through some of the uh, most commonly asked questions here. Um, probably the most common thing that's been asked is, uh, can I get my individual PQM scores? And that's an absolute, absolutely, uh, if you send us an email, we can send you those and, um, and, and send those out, no problem. And uh, a lot of positive comments and, and feedback mostly. Uh, and I think um, we will uh, definitely express our gratitude for that again. And uh, we will take a lot of these questions and go ahead and address those uh, in, in other forms because there's still a lot coming in, and I know we're running um, way, way past time here. But uh, I really appreciate your time dialing in, and, um, and thanks again.